the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. <coughs> Each year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem on the feast of Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to festival custom. After they had completed its days, as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances, but not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at the understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. As I mentioned at the beginning of this Mass, we continue our Christmas celebration this day by celebrating a particular feast known as the Feast of the Most Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And our Gospel this year for this feast is another one of those passages that is found only in Luke's Gospel. But to appreciate this passage, we got to swim backstream a few verses, especially to chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. And the scene is this. Mary and Joseph have just taken the baby Jesus into the temple precincts where they will have him circumcised and named, part of the rituals. It happened on the eighth day of life of a newborn baby. And as they are exiting, Mary holding the little newborn baby in her arms, we're told that sitting on the outskirts of the temple is a prophet by the name of Simeon. He's advanced in age and he's been sitting there for years. Why? Not because he was unemployed, but because he was waiting, as Luke tells us, for the consolation of Israel. Or in other words, he wanted to see who the savior of his people would be. He prayed all the time for God to just let me live long enough to see that and when I see it, you can take me home. And lo and behold, can you imagine the joy in his heart when he looked and he saw that little baby in Mary's arms. And he does something rather unusual. He walks up to Mary, he takes the baby into his arms, and he says to God, now you can take me, I've seen what I need to see. And then he blesses the baby and gives the baby back to Mary. And notice what he says. He says to Mary, this child that you're holding in your arms, so close to your heart, is destined to be the rise and the fall of many in Israel. And you, Mother Mary, your heart is going to be pierced because of him, as though it were with a sword. What an incredible thing to say to a new mother, huh? What would you think if someone said that to you? But you know what? Notice what Mary did. Luke uses two verbs, one that's found only in his gospel of all the places in the Bible, and the other is found in some other places. The verb unique to Luke is symbole. What does symbole mean? It means to toss around, as though you were tossing a salad. And the other verb, sinterang, means to keep or to cherish, to treasure in your heart. Or in other words, what is Luke saying? Rather than to get upset with Simeon, as most mothers would after hearing something like that, she puts it in her heart because she knows that God is speaking to this holy man, Simeon. 
She just needs to understand what the full meaning is going to be, and that will take some time. She gets a little piece of it, however, in today's gospel. Another passage unique to St. Luke, Jesus is 12 years old. The family has done what was expected of every 12 year and older male, and that is to make a pilgrimage all the way from Nazareth to Jerusalem in the south to celebrate the feast of Passover. Now what's interesting, that's an 80 mile trek by caravan and would have taken them every bit of four days, including some pit stops along the way. And so there they are celebrating this eight-day feast which commemorates the liberation of the slaves from Egypt, and then all of a sudden they head back. In this caravan, the adults would have been in the front carriages, the children would have been in the latter carriages. But during one of their stops, Mary and Joseph noticed that 12-year-old Jesus is missing. And as you might imagine, any of you who are parents, they're terrified, anxious, says Luke. And so they decide after a diligent search to retrace their steps, a wise move. And they go all the way back to Jerusalem, where they find their 12-year-old Jesus. Where? Sitting inside the temple, where only the elders were allowed. Surrounded by the scribes and the Pharisees, the experts in the law, and all of these people are older. And there's Jesus listening to them, but also teaching them. And we're told by Luke that everybody who sees this is amazed. Well, his mother is not amused. She may be amazed, but she's not amused. So she walks up to her boy, and she does what any mother would do. How could you do this to us? How could you do this to us? We were worried sick. We looked all over the place for you. And notice what Jesus does. He looks at her calmly in the eyes and says, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Students in the past have asked me, well, was Jesus being rude? No, rudeness is a sin, a venial sin. Jesus would never commit a sin. He's sinless. But what he sang to Mary is another example of what Simeon had prophesied. Your heart would be pierced because of him. You see, this lesson that Mary is going to learn with that statement of Jesus is that Jesus is not exclusively her own. He belongs to his heavenly Father and to his people. And that relationship of father and son will supersede every other relationship in Jesus' life, including his mother. How do we know that? We'll fast forward a few more chapters to chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. Once again, another interesting scene. There's Jesus and his disciples taking a rest along the road, when all of a sudden we're told that Jesus' mother and his family come and they want to have an audience with Jesus. And so they, they say to one of the disciples, ask him to come and talk with us. Jesus does not go. And said, he says to that disciple, you go tell them, my mother, my brother, my sisters, my family, are those who hear the word of God and act on it. Was Mary hurt by the statement? Of course not. But another heads up that Jesus had something most important to do. And she would have to learn to relate to him in that regard. What's the point of the story for us? To be a hard part of the Holy Family certainly was a wonderful experience. Each of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus are a part of his family. We are his disciples, his brothers and sisters. But there's another side to the coin. Remember Simeon's prophecy, the rise and the fall of many in Israel? Well, this week while you were enjoying your eggnog and eating your fruitcake, while you were enjoying time with family and friends, and hopefully you got plenty of that to do with plenty more to do, because remember, we Catholics don't stop celebrating Christmas until January 13th of this year, you may not have had time to come to daily Mass. And if you had, this is what you would have said. 
The very day after Christmas, December 26, when I came out to do Mass, I was dressed in red vestments, not in order to match Kobe's poinsettias, which are incredibly beautiful this year, but because it was the feast of a martyr. In fact, the first martyr of the Catholic Church, a man named Stephen. We hear about him in Acts chapter 7 and 8. What do we hear about him? He was told to stop preaching about Jesus. He was told to, to stay away from this gospel of Jesus Christ. Stephen could not stop speaking about Jesus. And so he was singled out by a man named Saul, who would later become Paul, and a mob gathered. And they stoned him to death. And there was his lifeless body in the street, riddled with blood and broken bones from the stoning that he, that he took for Jesus Christ. What an incredible feast to separate, celebrate the day after Christmas. You would think the church would say, okay, we're going to give you a break from some blood and gore for a while. Maybe we could celebrate some happy times. But no, they chose the feast of St. Stephen. And that's not all. The next day... The 27th of December, we celebrated the Feast of St. John, the Gospel writer. His life was interesting. At the age of 95, and after having been warned by the Romans to shut up with preaching Jesus Christ, he was arrested. He was hauled to Rome. And his sentence, he was tossed into a vat of boiling oil. And guess what? He came out of it without a scratch, not even a blister. Why? Because even at the age of 95, Jesus knew he had more work to do. You get no rest with Jesus in this life. Then the next day, December 28th, I wore red again. Why? Because of the Feast of the Holy Innocents, we call it. And what does that feast commemorate? Well, if you go back to Matthew chapter 2, you hear that wonderful story found only in Matthew's Gospel about the Magi. They come looking for the newborn king of the Jews, and their first stop is to go to the person they thought was the authority, King Herod. They asked Herod. Herod doesn't know a thing. He doesn't know that this baby was born right under his very nose. And so Herod says to the Magi, you go find him. And when you find him, report back to me in terms of his location, because I want to go pay him homage too, if he's a king. Well, Herod has no desire to worship this baby. He wants to kill the child. It's his competitor in his sick thinking. So the Magi go off, they see the baby, and they are told by an angel, do not go back to Herod, go back to your homeland by another group. And they do. When Herod finds out, he is furious. The envy, the anger, the rage just eat him up. And he dispatches his soldiers to kill all of the male children of the house of Israel, aged two and under. It was a brutal slaughter. Thousands of children and babies, heads dashed against the rocks. Why? Because of the hatred and the envy of Herod. And because of the truth. And then the next day, yesterday, the 29th, we celebrated the feast of a man by the name of Thomas Beckett. He died in the year 1170. He was an English citizen and an interesting man. In his early 20s, he was a womanizer and a charlatan. He made a bad, bad name for himself. But he had also was a childhood friend of the man who would become King Henry II of England. Thomas had an incredible conversion experience, and I'll spare you the details. But he ended up getting himself ordained a priest and then in time was appointed the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury, because there was only one church there. But look what happened. King Henry really loved Thomas and he wanted him to be a government official as well. So he appointed him the Chancellor of England. And that's when the relationship went sour. King Henry II, wanted to make some moves against the Catholic Church, basic, basically putting him over the Pope and its authority in England. And Thomas wanted nothing to do with it. Kind of like an encroachment of the government against the Church, as we're experiencing in America here today. But look what happened. Thomas fled. 
He was invited by King Louis XIV of France to spend some time there in sanctuary, and he did. But the Lord kept speaking to his heart and saying, go back, go back, go back to England. And he did. And he knew it would cost him everything. And it did. And what happened? Well, his buddy King Henry II was sobbing one day and pouting about how Thomas had treated him with such disrespect. And four of his trusted knights went looking for the Archbishop of Canterbury. And they found him one night, right before evening prayer. And the four knights struck him many times with blows from their heavy swords. In fact, three times they struck him with their, with their swords, and it would not knock Thomas to the ground. Finally, one of the knights sliced the top of his head off, his brains and his blood went all over the floor of the cathedral, and that was the end of Thomas Beckett. We call him St. Thomas Beckett because of his fidelity to the truth. He refused to give in to the king. My point is this. St. Teresa of Avila, back in the 16th century, complained to the Lord one time. She said, you know what, Lord? No wonder you have so few friends the way you treat them. But you know what? If you become a friend of Jesus, if you are a part of his family, be prepared. It may cost you dearly. Ask Stephen, the Holy Innocent, St. John, St. Thomas Becket, what it cost them. It cost them everything. Are you prepared to be a part of that family, though? You know, Mary could have very easily, on one sense, said, Oh, oh, the rise and fall of many of Israel and a pierced heart? No, thank you. No, thank you. I'd rather not have that experience in my life. But guess what? When she said yes to the angel Gabriel to bring the Savior into the world, she meant yes to everything. And so it is with us. If we say that we celebrate the Savior and we love the Savior, are we willing to suffer and even die for the sake? Will it cost us that much? Yes, it could cost you a great deal in this life. You know, Christmas Eve Mass coming out of a church in northern Nigeria, 12 Nigerians were beheaded by extremists coming out of Christmas Eve Mass. Right now, the people who own Hobby Lobby are in big trouble with the federal government. We all were warned about it. I warned you all many times, almost every Sunday, and a few got upset with me about it. And I'm talking about the HHS mandate, the Department of Health and Human Services mandate. And here was it saying to Hobby Lobby, you must provide abortifacient drugs for your employees. The owner of Hobby Lobby, an evangelical Christian, says, I can't do that. I can't make abortions happen in conscience. This week, Supreme Justice Sotomayor ruled against Hobby Lobby. They are facing a $1.4 million a day fine. Why? Because of their faith in Jesus Christ. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to us? Guess what? August 1st of 2013, we are subject to the same law. What's going to happen? Are we going to remain strong and faithful to Jesus? Or are we going to buckle to the pressure? The same thing could be said of parents who are truly disciples of the Lord. Are you willing to stand up against the cultural influences in your society and be strong parents? Not friends to your children, but strong parents. And the same could be said about the way we play, the way we work, the way we run our businesses, the way we run our lives. Are we faithful to Jesus above all things? Or do we buckle when things get tough? You know, Simeon's words are pretty incredible, very intimidating. He is the cause of, of the rise and fall of many. Jesus forces us at times to choose for him or against him. The question is, what are you going to do? It's so amazing when you look into that manger and you see that cute, cuddly little infant baby to think that he would cause so much turmoil in people's lives. But here's the big point. Sometimes it takes turmoil before true peace comes about. Jesus said in John 14, I came to give peace, a peace that the world cannot give. Jesus' way 
is the only way for us. So my brothers and sisters, you celebrated his birth. Are you ready to stick it out with his life? Let us pray for the grace from the prayers of the Holy Family to remain strong to Jesus in all things and at all times.